traveling and the travel uh, itinerary and all that that you have. So, Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for your peace in this house. Thank you for the blessing of God. Lord, I appreciate your presence. Lord, you're such a mighty, awesome Heavenly Father. And I thank you for the goodness of God. Thank you for the healing power of God. Lord, especially upon Sister Ollie right now, that the grace of God would be upon her that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon her. And I thank you for total, complete restoration from anything she's dealing with in her physical body. Lord, thank you for the grace of God keeping her in all her ways. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so um, this is part two of the sermon that I preached last weekend. Um from agitation to peace, or from an agitated spirit to a peaceful spirit. I got through it about halfway, and, and there was more I needed to talk about. I didn't get to, but I'm going to try to finish this up today. So um, how many of y'all uh, appreciate the peace of God? Amen. How many of y'all would like it more in your life? Yeah, amen. That's something. Uh, peace is just something the whole world is striving for peace in some way or the other. And this is something that is, um, to most people, it's like chasing the setting sun. And uh, unfortunately, to many, even Christians, it's much the same way. And so uh, we, we, we read out of Isaiah 59, and I'm going to go there again just to kind of gather context for the rest of the, the part two of this sermon. But uh, I, I really felt when the Lord brought this scripture to my spirit here a few, few weeks ago that um, God's people are experiencing peace, but we're only experiencing it in, in intervals and seasons. And our Heavenly Father is calling us to a way of peace. And that way of peace is is found in our walk of life and in our pathway of life. And when, uh, when God called Abraham, in uh, fact, back there in Genesis, when he changed his name from Abram to Abraham, to the father of many nations, he gave Abraham a charge and he said, walk before me. And uh, so I believe that's what our Heavenly Father wants out of you and I is as men and women of faith, to walk before him. Now, that really sounds like a, uh, a cliche sort of a statement because uh, it sounds like a very general term. However, I think there's something about walking with our Heavenly Father day in and day out that brings a connection with him that he wants to, in turn, uh, leave his peace with us and that peace be a protection and a shield in our life, especially in our everyday lives. Because it's easy to come into the house of God, and it should be something that happens. We come into the house of God on a Sunday morning, on a Wednesday night, or we have special meetings, and we love the presence of God. Amen. It's awesome. The manifest presence of God that's here and the, the, the love that we feel amongst our brothers and sisters and the family of God, it's something that our heart yearns for more of. And I believe that the manifest presence of God is something that we can experience. However, at the same time, I, this way of peace that I'm talking about, I still believe is a little different than that because um, I think we can all agree that the circumstances of life can sometimes buffet us. Um, they, they push at us. They try to uh, fog up the pathway before us. They try to get us into confusion. And we know that God has said he will never leave us nor forsake us. We know that. However, the peace that should be present in our lives because of that knowledge many times seems to elude us. And what I'm talking to you about is not a theory. Um, this is something that has been unfolding in my life as a pastor, especially over the past year. God has done, I've, I've told you, God's done a deep and an intense work in my life. 
in, in a new, in a fresh new way. And I know that um, what he's leading me into is more than just a season of peace. It's more than just, you know, a, a place, you know, where you just experience awesomeness for a while and then you go back to the the old uh, difficulties of life and things buffeting you and trying to take away your peace and stealing your peace and all that. This is a walk of the peace of God being in here and you know it's there and it's there to stay. And I believe that is something that all of us, if we were honest with ourselves, we would say we want it. Amen? So hopefully I'm not getting too deep right off the bat. But uh, let's talk about some of the things that could disturb that peace. But first, let's read that scripture in Isaiah 59. So Isaiah 59, verse 8. And this scripture is also echo echoed in the book of Romans chapter 3. It says, The way of peace they know not. There is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goes therein shall not know peace. Now, I've read this passage of Scripture for many years, knew it was here, uh, would have always identified this passage of Scripture as people that are living in sin, people that may be part of this world system, and never really uh, had this Scripture, in a sense, come home to roost. Amen? Uh, and so I believe much of the Word of God is like that. We think that, well, that's not really for me because that's for someone else because I'm really not that bad. I'm not in trouble that much. And uh, at the end of the day, without the mercy of God, without the grace of God on our, on our lives, we are in trouble. Can someone say amen? Because uh, we are human beings that are prone to wander. We are prone to go astray. And uh, so this passage began to take on new light. And it says in verse 9, it says, Therefore is judgment far from us, neither does justice overtake us. We wait for the light. Now, how many of you as Christians, as believers that love God, you have found yourself in this right here? You're waiting for for something. You actually want the light to come. And you're looking for a better way. You're looking to get out of your confusion. You're looking to get out of the turmoil. You want out of the torment. You can't understand why there's blocks in your life because at the end of the day, you love God and you want what's best for yourself. You want what's best for God in your life. However, we're stymied and buffeted at the same time, we wait for light, we uh, uh, but behold obscurity for brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind. Have any of you gone through a season in your life where it's like, God, everything is so foggy in front of me, and I don't know the way. It's, it's much like... Uh, the disciples there in John chapter 14, they, they looked at Jesus. Jesus is trying, he's, 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 he's admonishing them right before he leaves this world or right before he gets crucified. And I believe it was Philip or uh, one of the disciples uh, asked a question. They're like, Lord, uh, show us the way. How are we, how we going to get through this? And Jesus makes a very profound statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So I know we, we throw that scripture around very loosely, but at the end of the day, Jesus is this pathway. And if we can truly understand and begin to live the revelation that it says in the book of Acts, in him we live we move, and we have our being. Well, I believe, in my opinion, in Isaiah 59, this is talking about a group of believers that want more of God, that know there's more of God out there, but they're not walking in this pathway of peace that Jesus promised his people. He says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. 
not as the world gives, give unto you. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world, right? He said, uh, you know, in this world you're going to have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome all of that. And so, I believe because of that, there is more to this great salvation that we need to experience as God's people. So, we went through a list last week, and I'm just going to go through it real quickly. We talked about unforgiveness being a trespasser, and all these are blocks, These are things that keep us from walking in this pathway of peace. We talked about unforgiveness being a trespass. We talked about dealing with resentment. We talked about being offended, holding grudges, keeping a record of wrongs, painful memories. Any of y'all have painful memories? Well, those things are, they want to take the peace of God out of your life because there's torture that comes from those things. Uh, We talked about constant sorrow. We talked about uncontrollable grief. Despair, misery, loneliness, hopelessness, fear, fear of giving love, fear of receiving love, fear of tomorrow, fear of the unknown, fear of poverty, fear of dying, fear of losing a loved one, fear of getting sick, fear of being wrong, unhealthy, fear of God, fear of man. You see where we're going? We could probably name a hundred of them. And they are all designed by the enemy to keep you from walking in the peace of God. All of them. They are weapons that Satan has used in his arsenal for thousands of generations, millenniums, and they are arguably fairly effective, been fairly effective in keeping God's people from walking in the way of peace. Now, Satan knows if he can, if your default mode of life and your default spirit of life is driven by turmoil, confusion, frustration, uh, hopelessness, depression, if he can get you swimming in that mire all day, every day, He can keep you from walking in God's perfect plan for your life. And much of that turmoil, that those things that are disturbing the peace, they come because you and I have given them a right to be there. Can someone say amen? Say, preacher, you're preaching the gospel. They did not come, well, let me, let me, I, I do agree with the fact that there are generational iniquities that follow family trees and all that. But the interesting thing about the scriptures that talk about that, it says that I will visit. So even though you may be dealing with negative family traits and negative generational traits, at some point in your life, maybe even as an innocent child, you made a decision and you came into agreement with those thoughts and those ways of doing things. So because of that, Satan came in and he set up a stronghold in your mind that tries to keep you from God's word taking effect in your life. And you may say, that ain't fair. That's not fair that, that, that I would be taking, taken advantage of by the enemy as a young child. Uh, I know it ain't fair, but there's nowhere in the Bible that God says that Satan's going to play, play a fair game. There's nowhere. Uh, John chapter 10, Jesus said, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And there are all of us here have some kind of story in our life that was unfair. Just raise your head, uh, uh, just, just shake your head, yes. Okay, we all have that unfair story, right? And I'm sorry about that as a pastor. I really am. But what we need to get out of is the resentment and the bitterness that sets in because of that unfairness. And many times we, we begin to um, accuse God. We usually accuse one of three people. We accuse God. We accuse people that may have hurt us 
or we may accuse ourselves and feel, feel guilty about the shameful, shameful things that were done to us or that we did or committed in our lives. So hopefully I'm making sense. But let me just go down through the rest of this list. We talked about the fear of man. We talked about performance mindset. We talked about uh, drivenness, perfectionism, stress, worries, anxiety, rejection, envy, jealousy, sexual lust, fantasies. Preacher, stop now. No, there's a whole lot more. Uh, we, could, we could go through lists of this stuff. And this is why God's people are groping for the wall like the blind. This is why the way of peace we don't know. This is why we're in the same position that the disciples said. They're like, Lord, how are we going to know the way? How in the world are we going to get there? And Jesus is saying, follow me. Follow my walk of forgiveness. Follow my walk of, of communing with your heavenly Father. Follow my walk of being obedient to the Word of God and what the Word of God wants to do in your life. So sexual lusts, fantasies. Now fantasies, I'm going to get in a little bit of this later on, um, are a place that you and I go to to medicate ourselves from reality. It is... And typically we go there because we may not like who we are as a human being. That's actually emotions that most of us deal with. We don't like who we are as a person. The person that we hate the most is not our neighbor, it, not even our spouse. It's the person that we look at in the mirror every day. And so many times our mind goes into fantasies and, and those fantasies could be, you know, you know, it could be as simple as daydreaming. You're living in an other world that is not present from the real world, okay? Or you're living in the memories of the past. You know, uh, you, you hear people, uh, they get this certain tone when they talk about, oh man, those were the good old days back then. And there's this longing in their hearts to go back to those days so that I can escape the, the torture of my present reality. You see what I'm saying? And so all these things are designed by Satan. They're strategies of hell to keep you from walking in the peace of God. So fantasies, secrets of the past, some of the heaviest burdens that humanity deals with are secrets of the past. Maybe things that were done to you, maybe things that you know about family members, and many times these things are weights on people's lives, and they become heavy burdens, and because of those heavy burdens, eventually it catches up to us and begins to uh, affect our relationships with people. It could affect our health and things like that. And so I found uh, we've seen new, uh, uh, quite a bit of healing in the past uh, with people that have unburdened themselves from those secrets of the past. And because many times those things are, it's actually a torture, it's a weight that you as a human being were not designed and able to carry. That's why it talks about Jesus in Isaiah 53. He carried our sorrows. So those secrets of the past are sorrows, and sorrows are misery. They're darts that are trying to, to keep us from this pathway of peace. And so many times when we uh, confide in a loving brother or sister that we know is, is credible and is not going to be exposing our dark secrets. Many times people find healing and begin to find restoration uh, from those weights of the secrets of the past. Uh, other things like insecurity, control. Control and manipulation is always 
a fruit of something much deeper. And when a person is controlling and manipulative, it's typically it comes because there is a fear. There's a fear and an insecurity in their life that if I can't control things to fit what I think needs to happen or how I think life needs to unfold in my life, then things are not going to be okay. And so we continually are trying to control circumstances. And sometimes knowingly, many times unknowingly, trying to control the decisions of other people, trying to manipulate the decisions of other people to get the desired outcome that we have as a person. Can somebody say amen? And so because we think that the desired outcome that we have in mind is what God wants. How many of you, how many of you know that that kind of goes wrong many times? Amen. Because uh, we have this idea of what the perfect outcome is supposed to be like. Uh, and so we try to control and manipulate other people, circumstances to reach that spot. And when it doesn't happen, we lash out maybe in anger or we express disappointment and frustration to other people. And that thing begins to wear on our relationships, and people don't want to be around us because uh, human beings, for some reason or the other, we always resist control. <laughs> Amen. I got, I got three-year-olds and two-year-olds and five-year-olds in my life. They don't like being controlled. They don't like it. They, they notice it. You have an older sibling trying to control a younger sibling, there's going to be sparks in the house, typically. There's friction that comes because of that. So all you firstborns in here, you were never controlled. No, I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there. <laughs> but, and this is where it's, it's very important. It's very important as parents that we are being an example of leadership in our children's lives. And I understand there's a part of parenting that in a sense is controlling, but uh, it, it, we need to be leading our families in a proper manner because uh, people will always rebel against control. It just does not work. It doesn't work anywhere. It doesn't work in, in our relationships with our spouses. It doesn't work in our relationship with our children. It certainly doesn't work in the church. It don't work in business. Uh, somewhere there's going to be a clash when control is involved. And so that's why the scripture says of our heavenly father, the Lord is my shepherd. It doesn't say the Lord is my controller. I understand that he is Lord and that he is master and that we are his servants. There's a part of that that we'll never get away from. But at the end of the day, God leads his people. That's the way he wants to do things. And the Holy, the Holy Spirit, Brother Rhodes said this many times. He said, the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman, and he will not force you to lead him. Now, Satan, on the other hand, is the master controller and manipulator of this universe. And his kingdom controls and manipulates people to get you to a desired outcome that he wants instead of God. Hello. Is what I'm saying making sense? All right. So typically when, when a person is controlling and manipulative, it's always a sign of insecurity. Um, that person is insecure, and that insecurity comes from fear. Fear of, uh, could be a lot of things. There's a lot of fears that we can have. Um, and then uh, sleepless nights are another one. Uh, I think we can all agree that sleepless nights rob us of peace. Amen. And uh, I'm reminded of the scripture. We, uh, it's one of our bedtime scriptures that we quote to our children many times. I believe it's found in, uh, there's one in, I think it's in the book of Proverbs, uh, talking about 
will lay down and sleep, and our sleep shall be sweet. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. So there you go. Our safety essentially doesn't come from the great security system in our house. Amen? Uh, because those, those systems only keep humanity bad humanity outside of our walls. But the problem with most people that can't sleep is there's torment inside of here. And it doesn't matter what kind of a security system you have, whether you sleep with a 9mm on, one, on both sides of the bed, uh, it ain't big enough to, to keep away what's coming in here and tormenting us, amen? And so many times, People that are tormented with this fear, they're always looking outward, trying to, trying to nail down where that fear is coming from. And at the end of the day, it's, it's an inward problem that they're having in their lives. So one of the questions I ask, and here's where these two messages are overlapping a little bit, is this, what would your life be like if no one around you would have to live differently in order for you to be a fulfilled, contented person. Just what if your spouse would never change? Could you be a fulfilled, contented person regardless of whether or not he or she changes? That takes the, that puts the responsibility right back on ourselves, amen? Amen. Just what if your spouse is waiting to change at the end of you making a decision of not forcing her or him to change? Just what if the change is on the other side of that decision? Because many times we try to get in the way of God's process. And many times are the desired, uh, the desired outcome that we want in a situation could be different. Or let me say this, there's a different pathway that God takes to that desired outcome than what we want, than the pathway we take. Many times the desired outcome is the same, but the pathway to get there is different. Amen? You all understand that? So... What would, it, what would your life be like if no one around you would have to live differently in order for you to be a fulfilled, contented per person? How much stress would that take off of your life? But preacher, if my child would be this and this, then I could be a fulfilled, contented person. My wife would probably get the amen of 100% of the world around her if she would say to y'all, I would be a happier mother if I wouldn't have a special needs child. All y'all would cry over her and say, you're right, you're justified. Except God. <laughs> How many of you know that there are some things that happen in our lives that are out of our control? And I don't know why we can't fix them. We want to, don't we? We want to fix them as best as we know how, but we can't. But imagine what can happen if we just lay that down and say, okay, God, you said that my fulfillment isn't supposed to come from things of this world. And that is a thing of this world. Some of you, some of us, think that if my bank account would go from $5,000 to $100,000, I would be a fulfilled, contented person. Only to find out when you get there that that $100,000, you were chasing a setting sun. And now, the abundance that you've gathered has made you more fearful than ever before. Why is it that the richest amongst us live in gated, gated communities? Hello? 
the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. That's what Ecclesiastes, and this was written by one of the richest, wisest men that ever walked planet earth, King Solomon himself. And so we heap up things that we think are going to make us happier people, better people. And all the while, as we go after the wrong things in life, the trade-off is happening. Because with the abundance of this world comes the abundance of, <laughs> you all get the picture? The trade-off is darkness in here. Do you see why God's people haven't known the way of peace? Do you see why we need this pathway of peace? It's the will of God for our spirit, soul, and body to be living in a contented state of peace. That is the default state of mind that you and I need to live and walk in. Now, if you come to our home, we have a two-year-old, a five-year-old, and we have a special needs child. More than likely, there's going to be drama in our home. Like the other day, we heard a, Wah! and the one sister pushed over the other sister because the other sister didn't do what the one sister wanted her to do. Just push you over. You know. And so... Mom and Daddy, we had to play referee. But I asked my wife, I said, okay, so we need to start instilling in our children conflict res resolution. Hello. Do you think we can teach our children conflict resolution? Do you think if we teach them at two and five years old, uh, their managers wouldn't have to teach them or they wouldn't have to go to some kind of seminar when they're, you know, uh, looking job hunting in their 20s for, well, how do I do conflict resolution, you know? Uh, and so I told my wife, I said, and I got this, I think it was wisdom. I said, okay, you know, tell them you're sorry. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. So I looked at the perpetrator. <laughs> and I said, okay. So the next time this happens and she doesn't do what you want to do, this and this and this is how you should handle that. Don't you think that would be a better way? And even a five-year-old knows that's a better way. And so our agenda now is, you know, it's, it's impossible to, to, you know, steer all the conflict out of our lives. It's just, that's a utopia world. I chased it for a few years in my Christian walk, but I never found it. But... You and I living in a peaceable habitation, what's that look like? You and I living according to what Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. What does a peacemaker look like? What does a peaceable habitation look like? What does a peaceful marriage look like? What does a peaceful personal life look like? And I'm speaking today to born-again believers. This is for you. This is for you. So, many times we flip out over circumstances in our life because our insides are in a constant state of flipping out. So, talk about flipping out. So we were in Krispy Kreme par parking lot the other day. It was yesterday. Was it yesterday? Friday. Friday. Krispy Kreme. 86 years of making the, one of the best donuts. <laughs> oh, I can feel the conflict rising in this place right now. One of the best donut brands on planet Earth. So uh, you, you buy one dozen and get the second dozen for 86 cents. So we're on the way there to get a dozen of donuts. 
And my wife's like, oh, they're selling a dozen donuts today for 86 cents. And so she, so she pulls up her app. She's like, oh, I read it wrong. It says if you buy the first dozen, you get the second dozen for 86 cents. I'm like, oh, well, we're on our way now. I guess we got to get two dozen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we ended up with two dozen donuts. And uh, we're still working on them. Thank God. Uh, so uh, I'm in the parking lot of Krispy Kreme, and most of you that have been in there, it's tight. It's really tight in there. You have Krispy Kreme, you got, you know, it's, it's, it's calorie corner. Krispy Kreme, Olive Garden, Longhorn Steakhouse, the Cupcake Factory, Domino's Pizza, and, and Sweet Frog Ice Cream all in the same place. It's like people around here just live on junk food, right? And it's the first stop off the interstate. And so apparently driving down the interstate makes people crave comfort food because all that place, it's, it's the first stop. And so we're sitting in Dunkin' Donuts. I send my wife in after the donuts. And there's this vehicle backing out of the parking spot. And simultaneously, a vehicle is going through the, the lane behind it, to, you know, just passing through. And the vehicle almost backs into the person that's driving through. And there was, you know, immediately blast of the horn. And, and a, a lady was in a driver's seat of an SUV. And she went into full freakout mode. Just full freakout mode. And yelling and cussing. And so anyway, they stop a little. And both vehicles stop. The one's backing up and the other is going through. And they both stop. And the vehicle that was going through ended up finding a parking spot. Lady got out. I won't mention, I knew right away, I said, man, them people ain't from Virginia. I know that. And sure enough, they're from a state in the Northeast. <laughs> and we love Yankees, right? We love Yankees. <laughs> And this lady gets out of the vehicle, and she starts just a rant across the parking lot, just hollering obscenities and everything. And uh, I, was, I was very tempted to get involved in the uh, altercation, but I decided against it. Because it would have been kind of fun, you know, just like standing her up. Like, woman, this ain't your town. This is our Krispy Kreme, not yours, you know. <laughs> So, but in reality, this woman, she was living, she probably lives in flip-out mode, right? And so this person that back within two feet of her vehicle was the straw that broke the camel's back at 7 o'clock in the evening when she wanted a Krispy Kreme. And so this is where most people, they, they live there. And I'm here to tell you, we as Christians don't need to, Amen. Can someone say that? We don't need to live in this world because there's, there are innocent people that get caught in the crosshairs of our frustrations and our anxiety because we, we're, we live from a place of perfectionism, drivenness, and uh, what's the other one, honey? There's three of them, perfectionist, drivenness, and... Uh, Performance, that's what it is. Perfectionist, drivenness, and performance. We live in that world. And all three of those things, we want to control the outcome of what we want in life versus what God wants. And so that causes us to lash out in anger and all these other negative ways of doing life. So we flip out over circumstances. Because our insides live in a constant state of flipping out. We live life listening to a negative forecaster in our lives. You wake up in the morning, something bad's going to happen to you today. Any of y'all ever heard? You didn't even turn on the news. The news is going to tell you that. Probably even the weather. But you woke up, and there's this voice right here. Something bad's going to happen to you today. And you're like, mm, yeah, probably. So we live today expecting bad things to happen to us. And guess what? Statistically, 8 out of 10 something does. So 
The problem isn't that bad things happen to us. The problem is we live out of that mindset. And that mindset brings turmoil in our lives. And then when the bad things happen, the frustrations come out, the anger comes out, and we live in a constant state of putting out fires. Any of y'all ever manage people? You know, four, five, ten, you might be managing a big department of people, and you're putting out fires. Well, that's kind of, that's the normal life if you're managing people. However, um, God wants us to live from that contented place of peace. When our lives are in a constant state of negative forecasting, do you think we're peaceful or agitated? You think we're calm or worried? Worry is the expecting of bad things that are going to happen that didn't happen and may not happen. Many times don't happen. And so if faith is a substance of things hoped for, then fear is a substance of things not hoped for. And we can choose to have either. We think that fear is something that is just a part of our lives. Fear is not you. When God created you back in Genesis, he created man and he, he said it was good and he blessed them. And when Jesus came as your Savior and you, you, you received his salvation into your life, he redeemed you back into that, that place of peace and contentedness, very similar to what Adam and Eve uh, experienced in the Garden of Eden. Uh, very similar, I'm convinced. So, so if we live in a constant state of negative forecasting, are we calm or worried? Are we stressed out or are we confident? Someone that's stressed out day in, day out. You go to work dragging bottom. You come home dragging bottom. Let me break the news. It's not your job. It's not your manager. It's not circumstances around you. It's here. Did you know indecision is a very big stress giver? How many of y'all get stressed out when you have a big decision you got to make? Don't raise your hand. Did you know something else that uh, puts stress on your life? How many of y'all have ever second-guessed a decision you made? You made a decision... Two hours later, you're beating yourself up for it. And you don't know if it was a bad decision or a good decision, but you're wondering if you made the right decision. And so now you're stressed out because you think you might have made a bad decision. So I need to tell you something that happened yesterday. So it's Saturday morning. It's one morning of the week that if I don't have a busy day on Saturday, I, it's a morning to myself. And typically... When I had that kind of, I like to wake up early, you know. I wake up an hour or two before the children wake up and have my time alone with God. And it's peaceful. It's awesome. I don't have to think about going to work that day. And I can, you know, it's kind of a day where I can do, in a sense, what I want, along with some, you know, the normal chores around the house. And so yesterday morning, my wife woke up, normal time. It was sometime between 6 and 7. And I didn't wake up. 7.30 went past, I looked at the clock, I rolled over again, I went back to sleep. I woke up, it's 8 o'clock, and I think I rolled out of bed at 8.15. So, I woke up, I told my wife, I said, you know honey, I don't feel bad about sleeping in this morning. You know, that's a miracle. I grew up in a culture that if you slept in like that, you were lazy. And so, my wife should tell you, 
17 years of marriage. If I sleep in on Saturday morning, the rest of the day, I'm griping like, oh, I shouldn't have slept in this morning. Oh, my whole day was messed up because I slept in. Say what? What was I doing to myself all those years? Now, in reality, is sleeping till 8.15 in the morning sin? Come on. I mean, I, I wasn't missing any appointments. I didn't have to go to work. My children weren't up uh, 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 destroying the house. They were all still sleeping. So if it's not sin, then should I get down on myself for not sinning? No reason to. But I used to. Why? Performance, perfectionism, and drivenness. All down here and in here all my life. Programmed as a young child. Now, don't get lazy on me, y'all. I believe in working hard. But I had worked hard five days previous, right? And so, it's okay. Saturday morning, if you want to sleep in, yeah. Well, next Saturday morning, I probably ain't going to sleep in because I still kind of like waking up early. Amen? But it's this state of mind. It's this downing. We're always downing our decisions. And scientists will tell you that if you're always downing yourself, you are downing your serotonin levels. What happens when your serotonin levels go down? You don't feel good about yourself, do you? And when you don't feel good about yourself and your serotonin levels go down, you get into anxiety, you get into depression, you get into all these downers. And then you need pick-me-uppers, you know, you, you, you need pats on the back or you need something. Maybe addictions, things like that to try to get you back up in life. And many times people around us that deal with addictions, it's because they're always down on themselves. And they're looking for these, whether it's cigarettes, nicotine, alcohol, drugs, you're looking for something to pick you up out of this down state of reality. So, number one, this way of peace is living in the reality of the moment. And this is a revelation that is so important. Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So what in the world is Jesus saying by taking no thought for tomorrow? I'm still trying to figure out this scripture, but I think I'm grasping it more now than I did a few years ago. Uh, if we were to live how Jesus lived, he wasn't stressing out about the decisions that tomorrow is going to need. He wasn't laying awake at night worrying about things that may or may not unfold tomorrow. He was confident in the fact that if he would trust in his heavenly father, that he would be okay to be able to handle the things of tomorrow, tomorrow. Now, was Jesus not a planner? I don't think he, I think he was. I think by using wisdom, by, do, by studying the ant, according to the book of Proverbs, lays up for itself store for the winter, by planning properly, we actually mitigate the worries and the anxieties that come from being careless. Someone say amen. But there is something about you and I going to bed at night and laying down and experiencing the sweet sleep of peace. At least 68 hours of it is what we need according to science. And some of that varies differently from person to person. Uh, some less, some more, but in that range somewhere. You and I have been designed by God to need the sweet 
sleep of peace in our lives. And when we live in that peaceful, contented state, we go to bed, we sleep good, our bodies wake up, we're refreshed, and now today's decisions, let's take them on. So if the way of peace is living in the reality of the moment, you're not going to find it following Alice in Wonderland. I, I, I grew up, I was a daydreamer. I don't know, I'm sure there's statistics for that, but I was one of those statistics. I was a daydreamer. You know, I was, I was, the, I was the third stuck in the middle of two sets of two boys that were two years apart. There was four years in front of me, four years behind me, so I was kind of isolated a little bit. You know, I was just so deprived all my life. <laughs> and so... And so I would, I would go into these daydream modes when I was a youngster. And when you live in a daydream fantasy world, you're the hero, right? And it's a place that we escape to, to get away from the reality of the moment. And how many of you can agree that God is not, we ain't going to find God in our daydreaming fantasy world? God is a today God. He is a God that is here for the moment that we're dealing with today. And so some of us, we may, just, we may have just gone there as a child, never knew any different. And it, and, it, and it goes right into our adult life. And so we spend our lives running away from the reality, the hurt, the pain of the moment. And so we go into this fantasy daydream world, and it, it becomes a medication to pick us up, to, to make us feel better. And in return, there's always a return. There's always an exchange. When we go to places other than God for our fulfillment and contentment, there will always be something that will bite us in the backside. And before you know it, loneliness, self-pity, all these negative emotions that people want to resort to, that's all found in this place of fantasy and daydreaming. That's where you find some friends. Loneliness is an evil spirit that is not who you are, and I'm here to tell you, you can cast it out of your life. You ever hear the term, you know, people say, you know, I, I, I was in a crowd of people and I was so lonely. I felt so lonely because I just felt I was there all by myself. Did you know if you would have asked that crowd of people around you if anyone hated you, probably all of them would have said that you're a nice person. But the one person in the crowd that said you weren't a nice person, who was that? Uh-oh. It was you. In fact, it wasn't you. It was a lying spirit that told you you are a lonely person. And that is not you. That comes from the kingdom of darkness. You are not a lonely person. Can someone say amen? amen. All right, that's not, that's not who God created you. He didn't create you with that emotion. And so somehow we took on that emotion. We listened to the same lie that, that Eve listened to in the garden. And we said, oh, yes, lonely. That kind of feels good because I can isolate myself and avoid people. And we think that avoiding people is our place of refuge and safety. Uh-oh, ding, ding, ding. That's a lie. God created us as human beings to cohabit with each other, to love each other, to walk in the family of, as a family of God. And let me drop something else out there. For those of us that think there ain't no more good people in this world, that this whole world's evil and it's gone to the pot. Every day I meet beautiful, awesome Americans that love life and love people. And if you would really get into a difficult situation, they would be concerned and would actually want to help you out. That's the reality. The news cycle will tell you different. Your Instagram reel will tell you that there's evil people everywhere you go that are out to get you. 
And that is a lie, my friends. I'm not saying there ain't evil. I'm not saying that this world is getting better. It's probably getting worse. But there's a creator, our Heavenly Father, that has created all these people that we call evil. He created every single one of them. Created all of them. And he blessed them. So there's a seed of God inside of every person on planet Earth. And so when we believe the lie that says there's evil people everywhere, you might want to check the Word of God. You're not going to find it, uh, uh, this way of peace following Alice in the Wonderland. The memories of yesterday are not the vehicle that we're going to find peace in the reality of the moment. I love the awesome memories of yesterday. And they're great. I think it's healthy. It's godly to have them. But yesterday's memories are not today's reality. Trying to catch tomorrow is not our pathway to peace. Number two, a couple points here in closing. This way of peace is a lifestyle of trusting God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. When we lean on things outside of God, when we choose not to trust in God but lean on other things, we are leaning on broken things, broken entities, material possessions. They are broken. Your own understanding of life is a broken thing to lean upon. That's why he said, trust in me and don't lean on that that broken understanding that you and I may have. He that has no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. So if maybe you have no, you say, preacher, I can't control myself anymore. I'm here to tell you there's hope. There is hope for you. If, you. if you live with uncontrollable fear, depression, anxiety, I'm here to tell you that is not you. And because that is not you, there's hope for you. Psychology will tell you that it's you and you need to try harder and do better. And psychology is only partially right. But I'm here to tell you that God created you and you were good. And you've been fearfully and wonderfully made. And God did not create lonely people. God did not create depressed people. God did not create fearful people. We became that because we listened to the thoughts of the enemy instead of trusting in God. Number three, and this is my last point, this way of peace is freedom from turmoil and confusion. Peace is a protection to our spirit, soul, and body. I might have to preach a third message on peace. I'm not sure. We'll see. But there's so much more to say. Be careful for nothing. In other words, don't get anxious about anything. Well, preacher, how do you do that? I got a birthday party tomorrow, and I got to have this taken care of. I got to have this. I got to bake the cake. I got to I gotta get the party stuff. I got to get this. I got to call this person. You mamas, you know what I'm talking about. You know it. There is, life brings pressure, deadlines, and all these things. But I believe our Heavenly Father wants, to tack, wants us to tackle those things out of a foundation of peace in our spirit. And I really wonder if our outcomes wouldn't be so much better. I'm telling you. I believe our thinking process and the way we strategize and the way we think about people would be so much healthier. Do you think we would have as many broken relationships and things that try to bring wedges in between people? This is real. The peace of God has come to live inside of humanity that are born again and bought by the precious blood of Christ. And it's time we quit settling for intervals of peace. It's time we step into this pathway of peace. And it's time you and I take control over these thoughts that for many of us have run unchecked and unhindered in our life all of our life. And we didn't know there was a way out. 
And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10, he said, casting down those imaginations, those evil, ma we talked about that on Wednesday night, those evil imaginations, those evil thoughts. That the uh, prophet Jeremiah prophesied, he said, he talked about a people and he said, I will bring upon them the fruit of their thoughts. So if our thoughts are evil, what's going to be the outcome? Folks, God's calling us to a new world. It's time we step into it as people of God. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you today for your word. God, I thank you for wisdom. I thank you for understanding. Lord, you are a mighty, awesome God. You're a loving Heavenly Father. And I'm asking God as we come into this time of ministry, I'm asking God for the fruit of the Spirit, for the gifts of the Spirit to just blossom in each one of these young people, God. Thank you for your anointing here. Thank you for your grace and your favor and your goodness keeping us in Jesus' name. Mark, why don't we get you up here on the piano? You want to come up here and just 